Are there constructive things that you can do to help restore a culture of life? Find out next on this edition of Life Matters. Brian Johnston is the Western Director of the National Right to Life Committee. He has served in many capacities while advocating for innocent lives. As California Commissioner on Aging, as Chairman of the California Pro-Life Council, on the board of the National Legal Center for the Medically Dependent and Disabled. And now here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. We're your program on the right to life, which is a very specific assertion. It's an idea that is enshrined in America's founding documents, and it's been the aspiration of mankind throughout Western civilization. And that is that individual human lives are actually a gift by their creator, and that the government that governs those lives has a duty to ensure, first and foremost, that right to be alive and all of the rights that emanate from our uniqueness as human individuals. That's the chief purpose of government, that to ensure these rights, governments are instituted among men, is what the American founders said, and they wanted to be able to move that forward to more adequately provide a just form of government. So the debates we're seeing day to day, the battle of ideas that we're involved in right now, gets down to that very specific issue. And that is, what is a just society? What are just laws? And America is now wrestling with that up front. We're going to talk about the killing of George Floyd, the open and direct witnessing by the whole world of the intentional killing of a vulnerable human being. But more to the point, it wasn't a stranger, it wasn't a passerby, it wasn't merely a mugger that killed him. This is significant in that this was an agent of the state, a policeman who is sworn to that constitution, who is sworn to defend the lives of the innocent vulnerable to protect them. He was the perpetrator. So we saw two things. We saw the actual taking of a life. This wasn't a portrayal. This wasn't a TV show. This was the actual taking of a life and the robbing of the actual right to life. The legal duty to protect that life was not just ignored. It was inverted by that terrible crime. So we as a nation and the world at large, we are justly outraged. And I agree that justice needs to be sought for George Floyd because he is a human being. What we're seeing is the right to life is now on public display. The right to life was violated, and we should be justly outraged. But we're going to go into deeper depths for deeper understanding. Unfortunately, that police officer, Derek Chauvin, he abused his duty before the state and felt simply because he was an employee of the state and had that ability that he could exercise it. We give policemen guns and badges, but not simply to use as they see fit personally. There's a higher law that governs them, and that was violated. We're going to talk about chauvinism. We will talk about what is chauvinism. I am stunned that many people don't know about chauvinism. You may have heard that term, and it's immediately applicable to Derek Chauvin. Chauvinism is named for a French officer from the Napoleonic era, Nicholas Chauvin. We're going to talk about the significance of chauvinism before our eyes. And then we're going to go further. We're going to talk about race relations through the eyes of none other than Justice Clarence Thomas. And many of you know that I'm a fan of Justice Clarence Thomas because he's one of the leading advocates of natural law being the foundation of our laws. And I want to repeat what I've said before. If we don't have natural law as the foundation for our laws, we can't have just laws. We can't have a right to life. The concept of a right to life emanates from the principles of natural law. So this battle of ideas, this battle to determine what are just laws, what should we do as a society to protect the vulnerable, that's front and center right now. And we're going to let Justice Clarence Thomas comment on that. And there's a lot about Justice Thomas that you may not know. But finally, we're going to talk about something that has permeated our culture, that is the teachings of our culture And that, specifically, is a chap by the name of Charles Darwin. And believe it or not, that's an immediate, present debate. Because you cannot be a leftist or progressive unless you genuflect before Charles Darwin. 
And we'll talk about how that came to be as a culture and the significance of what that means for society. And we'll even touch on the Scopes trial of 1925. All of that is actually immediately related to the debate over whether an innocent human life should be protected and what we should do when an innocent human life is taken without due process of law. Very much related. We're going to go into all of that when we come back on Life Matters. Life Matters continues after this. Well, hi. I just wanted to thank you for joining me. You know, I have good friends, children, young adults, and adults that have Down syndrome. And they are so loved. Their parents love them so much because they're the happiest people you'd ever want to know. I really love them. I'm going to tell you something, though, that's rather frightening. The government of France has now prohibited showing positive images of Down syndrome children and letting parents know how lovable they are. That's an actual law in France. Here in the U.S., 80-some-odd percent of Down syndrome kids are killed by abortion before they're born. In France, it's 96 percent. So we're not a whole lot better. If you'd like to help out, you can go to the National Down Syndrome Society, NDSS.org, to help out. That's NDSS.org. We really are in a battle of ideas, and lives really are at stake. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. We're talking about some of the most important ideas that our nation has ever faced, and it's come to a head. I want to remind you, if you're new to Life Matters, what we talk about here, we talk about the battle of ideas and what exactly the right to life is. If you're an American, you're familiar with the American founding documents, and throughout the world, Everyone in Western civilization is familiar with the assertions of the American founding. And America's founders first and foremost asserted, there is a God. Unlike other revolutions, the French Revolution happened much at the same time. In fact, literally as the Constitution was being written, the French Revolution of 1789 was being written. That was a very different revolution. And if you've been taught, oh, it's the age of revolution and they're all the same, you are wrong. Because the French Revolution denied the existence of God or the involvement of God in our lives. The American Revolution is built on that assertion. The American Revolution asserted that we've been given our gift of life by a creator, and therefore, to have a just government, we must abide by the principles that our creator has put into nature. There are principles by which this overarching authority And that's probably the greatest distinction of the American government. That is that the government itself is not the ultimate authority. I'm going to repeat that. The American system asserts that the government itself is not the ultimate authority on what's right and wrong. That there is a higher law to which the government must be held accountable. This is referred to as natural law. Our founders didn't come up with that. If you look up the concept of natural law, it goes throughout Western civilization that there are higher laws that actually demonstrate right from wrong, and they can be discerned. This is an important assertion of Western civilization. And our founders took that and made a government based on that. The French Revolution, by the way, was completely different. It was based on how people felt. And a lot of the philosophers of that time, Voltaire, Rousseau, really had some disdain towards the idea of God's existence and literally felt that man is the measure of all things, what's called humanism, and that man could come up with a great way to live and a great way to address injustices. And therefore, they wanted a new form of government. That brings me to our discussion on Chauvin. As you recall, the man who murdered before our eyes, he murdered George Floyd before the eyes of the world, was a policeman, and his name was Derek Chauvin. That's exactly the Chauvin, same spelling, as Nicholas Chauvin, after whom we've named Chauvinism, a Chauvinist. And maybe you've heard the phrase, a Chauvinist pig, and Chauvinism. Chauvin was a French political officer. He was an officer in Napoleon's army and a huge fan of Napoleon. But you don't fully understand it unless you understand who Napoleon was and how infectious the attraction of Napoleon was as a leader and setting things right in Europe. He was the government. As you should know, the French Revolution is based on humanism. They didn't want a seven-day week. In fact, they intentionally 
didn't because it was from the Bible. They hated any references to God. They decided, we'll have a 10-day week. They wanted all measurements to be based on man's measure. And so revolutionaries created a lot of problem. If you follow the French Revolution, you're probably aware of the reign of terror it created because you could make up your own laws. And this was madness. It was brought to an end by one man, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte asserted that he was the state and would become a dictator, but he actually said, Je suis la révolution. I am the revolution. So he embodied all of this and was going to bring change. He became a very powerful dictator, as you know. He swept through Europe, bringing change. People love change. And that brings us to the battle of ideas and how these revolutions come to pass. They are battles of ideas. And Chauvin was an officer that when Napoleon was finally overthrown and a new republic was put into place, Chauvin resisted. And he insisted that the dictatorship of Napoleon and the freedom of the French Revolution was the ultimate answer for the state. So it wasn't just that he was a patriot, and a lot of people dismiss chauvinism as patriotism. He was a male, and therefore a male chauvinist pig is someone with definitive ideas that doesn't do what other people say, and therefore they're a chauvinist. That is not what a chauvinist is. That is not who Nicholas Chauvin was. Nicholas Chauvin was a statist, and he believed the power of the state had been embodied in Napoleon Bonaparte, and that he shared in that. See, that's the power of progressive ideology regarding government, is that our whole identity, if you're a progressive, is to identify with a new state order that's going to change everything and bring all good stuff to pass. And Chauvin was part of that, and that was his identity. And he felt as an employee of the state, his identity was in the revolutionary state of Napoleon, that needed to return. And so that's where we get the name chauvinism. And we saw that same thing in Nicholas Chauvin. Because he had the power of the state, he had a badge, he had a gun, and he felt he could employ it the way he saw fit. He was going to exercise chauvinism. The power of the state will be implemented as he sees fit. And that's what Hegelian progressivisms do. We've talked about that in the past. You can go back to earlier podcasts. But basically, progressivism... As an ideology, it's not talking about technology. No, progressivist ideology is talking about government and what form of government you have. And ultimately, progressivism means changing government and empowering the state to be the moral arbiter of truth. And if you're an employee of the state, you get to employ that. So this is a very scary thing. And we see the abuse of power in that by definition. And our American founders say, no, that's an abuse of government. That's why they started this new government. Government needs to be under a higher law. And so I'm looking forward to the trial of Nicholas Chauvin. He abused the power of the state. I'm looking forward to the trial of his four accomplices. And some of them apparently made some effort to stop it. We're going to let a trial determine that. And that's why we have our freedoms as individuals are protected and individuals are held accountable. Under progressivism, as we've mentioned before, in particular, Judge Clarence Thomas has mentioned, progressivism deals with groups. And he himself was set aside as being a member of a group. And he was attacked when he was nominated for the Supreme Court. He didn't think like a black man should think. It's a very powerful movie I recommend in his own words, the Clarence Thomas story. And it's called Created Equal. You need to get a copy of that. It is released in 2020. It was released in January of 2020. It's available for streaming or ordering a DVD. Extremely powerful. It gives his life story. He was born in true poverty. He actually grew up in Savannah. And you'll find out by reading his story, the trials he had to overcome. But he decided he needed to learn and become educated. You may not know this about Clarence Thomas. He was a black radical in his college years. And it was actually after a riot in Boston that he was part of that he realized he was being animated not by knowledge and logic, not by reason. He was being animated by pure hate. And the hate was eating him up. And at a certain point, he realized he couldn't free himself from this. And he asked God to please free him of the hatred. And that was the beginning of a walk of faith for Clarence Thomas. Again, if we've talked about this before, faith is not non-reason. Faith actually is the result of reason, of true reason about objective reality. We've talked about that before. That's the predicate the America's founders asserted. These are self-evident truths. 
that we are created by a creator. That's a matter of faith. Faith is substance. Faith is evidence. And Clarence Thomas came across that, that there is a better way. And it's the same conclusion our founders came to. By the way, since we're on this very quickly, I want to remind you, people say that, oh, our founding was a bigoted founding. If you read Abraham Lincoln, please do. I recommend read the writings of Abraham Lincoln, whose monument was desecrated recently. But Abraham Lincoln is very clear. It's only because America was founded on self-evident truth that all men are created equal. That was why we were able to end slavery. We couldn't if that had not been our foundational premise as an aspiration for America. And he knew we could not continue half slave and half free. Slavery must come to an end. Read Lincoln on this. We were not founded as a racist nation. And many of the founders, Franklin and many others, were leading advocates against slavery. But at that moment in time, They could not have become a nation if they tried to simultaneously in 1776 end slavery, but they laid the foundation stone to do so. So we are founded on self-evident truths. We are founded on the principle that we have a creator. And in Western civilization, we see that echoed. This idea that human beings are not merely animals, that we have a spiritual nature that can recognize spiritual truths, higher laws. We need to check objective facts right now. At this moment, nearly half the nations on earth have no laws against slavery because they don't believe in higher law to which they're accountable. They use traditions of men and their cultural values. Check Reuters. Check the stats from the UN. Right now, slavery is being practiced. America is an exception because we believe in the value of the individual life. If you're able to recognize there are higher laws, if you recognize that that was an injustice that was done, to George Floyd, you're recognizing that was a higher law of being violated. So that's to our credit that we're able to recognize that. We are not merely animals. Some cultures and some ideas think that we're merely animals to be herded, and the job of government is to herd animals by groups. However, in America, our founding was based on the value of every individual life. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's taught now in our schools And what young people have been taught about our freedoms and the value of the human person, there's a lot of false ideas being taught as truth. And unless you recognize their falsity, you will not be able to explain why this is wrong. So when we come back, we're going to talk about what's being taught now to our culture at large, why it is false, how you can easily demonstrate its falsehoods, but you have to be willing to engage in the battle of ideas. Life Matters continues after this. They say sunlight is the best disinfectant. Did you know that California has a law in the books that says you need to protect babies born alive in the course of an abortion? But that law is simply ignored. The current legislature and Governor Newsom's administration support all abortions all the time. And they simply do not examine or regulate the practice, even though our tax dollars pay for it. We need to shine a light on this cover-up of the abortion industry in our state. Go to CaliforniaProLife.org and click on the Light of Day Project. We need the facts about late-term abortion to be examined and made known. We need the government doing its job to protect lives. We need the light of day on this. Go to CaliforniaProLife.org. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. So we're talking about some pretty big issues after the killing of George Floyd. But how the killing of George Floyd illustrated there is a right to life. We saw his life and his right to be protected by the law violated by a law enforcement agent, Derek Chauvin. We explained the real history of Chauvinism, how Chauvinism is the arrogant superimposition of statism. That is, that the state is the ultimate arbiter of what should come to pass. Chauvin was a passionate Bonapartist. That was a dictator. And yet we see that employed all the time, where people who work for the state think that that empowers them to bring about their feelings 
and their conclusion that they're the ones with the best sense of judgment, and their job is to herd us all as an agent of the state. They're merely herding groups. And so just as Mr. Derek Chauvin thought his office would allow him to exercise his opinion and fully exercise the authority of his office against another individual, how is that different than, let's say, another police agency like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI director taking it upon himself to be an agent of the state? That's his office. He gets to use it as he sees fit. No, that's a violation of the role of government. And we're seeing this routinely, and many people don't recognize it, that the abuse of office, the abuse of power to superimpose your will on another is not constitutional, it is lacking sound judgment, and it does not give a recognition of the real foundations of our Constitution and of the freedoms we have that God has given us as individuals and that it's the duty of the government to protect individual lives. And that was clearly shared by Clarence Thomas. Again, I strongly recommend you read more about Justice Clarence Thomas, who dealt with race issues and dealt with the false ideas of progressivism. There's a wonderful scene. It gives out the whole depiction. And ironically, the leader of the white cabal of Democrat members of the Senate Judiciary Committee were determined to stop Clarence Thomas's nomination. And if you go back and look at that, There were accusations brought against Clarence Thomas of a sexual nature, very similar, very similar to what we saw decades later against Justice Kavanaugh. They needed to stop Clarence Thomas. And the way they did that, and you see the questions being asked by none other than then-Senator Joe Biden interrogating Clarence Thomas on what do you really mean by natural law? You're a suspect. You better come forward on what this really means. And I'm not going to tell you the rest. Some of you know his responsive speech. It's a powerful speech. It's much longer than a powerful line. He said this is a high-tech lynching. He was referring to the fact that the KKK had never come after him, but now there was a group of white people who demanded that all black people think the same, and they were going to prevent him from moving forward. It's a powerful indictment of progressive ideology, and it's racism. Which brings me to something you may not realize. If you're familiar, it's a debate. In American history, the Battle of Ideas, they had two of the most famous orators of the time in 1925, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow, debated whether or not the teaching of evolution in public schools should be allowed. Let me just cut to the chase. The issue of evolution is something that if you don't think about deeply, you're not going to see its threat. But if you read the front piece of the actual book on evolution, The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, it's the theory of natural selection. But many people don't know its subtitle. He explains its real purpose and description. Let me read it to you. Or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. It's very clear that Charles Darwin was a racist and believed that people have developed. And since they're struggling to a favored position, there are less favored races. And it's the predicate for seeing others as inferior and that society and human beings are still developing. Therefore, it's for us developed people to control things. And as you know, if there is no God that created us, then there is no controlling authority. There are no actual values to hold accountable a government. If we simply are the product of the accident of fate and history, it's what we do that makes the difference. We get to change things. The struggle of the favored races and the preservation of these favored races in the struggle of life. That's the predicate That was not allowed to be taught as truth. And in 1925, ironically, it was prohibited from being taught. But now, because of the media view of this and because of the cultural view of Hegelian progressivism, which is extremely common, now you cannot teach anything other than that. And even the concept of intelligent design today is prohibited from being taught. If you're asserting that God made you and that God gave you the gift of life, you're actually not allowed to say that in a public school. And I assert it's a belief that it can't be proven that we came from quadruped amphibians and then developed into quadruped mammals and then developed into bipedal mammals. That actually cannot be proven. It is asserted. It's an assertion that uses pseudoscience. But you have to believe in that pattern and jump to that conclusion. I personally believe that in The Origin of the Species, we see a very clear presentation of the concept of adaptation. 
I believe in adaptation. I adapt all the time. It's a wonderful gift to be able to adapt. And you see in nature the adaptation. You can see the incredible differentiation, for example, in the species canine. The domestic canine is so diverse, and yet it's still part of the canine lupus family, the family of wolves. And yet you can have a chihuahua. You look at all the different pugs, you look at all the different animals there are, but they're all canines. What has not been proven is the transspecies alteration. That's the result of adaptation. That is a leap of faith. And even at the Scopes trial, they simply wanted it taught as another belief. They recognized it was a belief system, unprovable, and therefore they didn't want creation taught because that was only teaching one particular faith. They wanted different religious, it's a pseudoscientific religion. It's a jump to conclusion that transspecification has taken place. And now, not only is that taught as soul truth, but the idea of intelligent design is banned from America's schools. The problem is that, as all progressives know, as a progressive, you have to adhere to the assertions of Darwin's origin of the species. You are not a progressive if you don't adhere to that. But even Darwin said it's the very predicate and foundation for a racial view of inferior and superior human beings. It is a racist tome. And as Clarence Thomas pointed out, it's actually the left that believes in grouping people by races. It is the left that pits group against group. It is Hegelian progressivism to say one group needs to be brought down because we have a new idea about justice. It is progressivism that says that men oppress women and having children makes you a mother and therefore the family is important. We need to be able to kill children so that you're not oppressed. That is feminism. That is the heart of progressivism. And unless you recognize these ideas that are imbuing our culture, you will not be able to win this battle of ideas. The intrinsic value of each and every human life is a self-evident truth. You can see it in nature. The laws of nature and of nature's God reveal that. And you can demonstrate that. That's what our founders said. And that's what the right to life is really all about. As I said at the top of the program, the killing of George Floyd was a demonstration that the right to life is essential. That violating the right to life violates the principles of a just government. And I'm in complete agreement. We must have a trial. We must have justice for George Floyd. But that does not justify changing our entire society and treating people as groups. It isn't because George Floyd is merely a member of a group. It's because George Floyd and each of us are unique individuals. And if we want true justice, our laws must treat every human being as a unique individual given the gift of life. Life Matters is a production of the California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of National Right to Life.